The F-18 Hornet is the Navy's most advanced airplane. Flying as both a fighter and ground attacker, the Hornet can deliver punches in any arena. Swarming onto its target, enemy forces wait in fear of the killer bee. Over the blue waters, 30 miles off the coast of San Diego, aircraft of the U.S. Navy's Pacific Fleet swarm the mighty ship that awaits their arrival. One by one, the planes descend upon their new home, the USS Abraham Lincoln. Flying one of the most advanced strike fighters in the world, a pilot guides his F-18 Hornet toward the arresting cables on the back end of the Lincoln. With only four wires to catch and little room for error, such landings are never routine. Now safely aboard, the pilot will join the rest of his squadron in a familiar room one level below the flight deck. Okay, uh, departure warning tone will activate at uh, wet AOA full flaps. 12, 12, 12, 12, 12. And These are the pilots of Strike Fighter Squadron 94. They call themselves the Mighty Shrikes, named for a carnivorous bird with a daunting reputation as a skilled predator. The Mighty Shrikes have joined the rest of Air Wing 11 for a week of flight operations. This is the culmination of their workup cycle. The purpose of workups is to prepare the entire Air Wing for a six-month deployment set to begin next month. Good. And uh, last... For some of the younger pilots, the upcoming deployment will be their first. However, for seasoned veterans like skipper Matt Pasteleniak, the next six months will bring with it the familiar cycle of both boredom and excitement. That's it. When an air wing begins this phase of workups, one of the first duties is live weapons training. The F-18 is both a fighter and an attack plane. So for the two Hornet squadrons aboard the Lincoln, weapons training is a busy period. Some pilots will drop bombs, and others, like Lieutenant Brenda Shifley, will fire air-to-air -air missiles. I'm gonna be firing a air-to-air -air missile, my first. I've never actually shot one. We're gonna be firing at a drone out about 100 and something miles off the coast. It's gonna be pretty exciting. It's got a warhead on it. <laughs> the F-18 carries a wide variety of weapons. The Maverick is a medium-range air-to-surface weapon used against both ships and targets on land. The Harm, or high-speed anti-radiation missile, is used to destroy enemy radar stations. During the Persian Gulf War, the Hornet's air ground capabilities were put to use. Everything from laser-guided weapons to conventional bombs were hurled at Iraqi targets. Snake bill. You're on anybody right now. For air-to-air -air combat, the Hornet is now equipped to carry the new advanced medium-range air-to-air missile, or AMRAM. The purpose of live missile training is not simply to shoot down any target provided. Often, several drones are launched into the air at the same time. Using the radar signal provided, the pilot must identify which represents the enemy and which is a friend. The need for such training was made tragically apparent when two Air Force jets accidentally downed an Army helicopter over northern Iraq. When that happened, it really strikes a lot of pilots because to us it makes it seem like everybody looks at us like we're a bunch of knuckleheads. And it's very professional and very precise. After that happened, we totally reevaluated all our rules of engagement. And now you're going to be absolutely certain that that is not going to happen again, which is, which is important. When you squeeze the trigger, you're going to be 100% sure that that person is, is the enemy and not a friend.
The downing of a friendly helicopter represents one of the greatest fears of any fighter pilot. Jeopardizing the lives of fellow servicemen is the worst of all possible scenarios. So when F-18 squadrons were called upon to help enforce a no-fly zone over Bosnia-Herzegovina, the mistake made in Iraq was fresh on the minds of all the pilots involved. 1951, 10. Okay, you're gonna drop a mark on the south one there. I guess the western one. Two of them, looks like five-bladed props. Go back to wide field of view, get a look This is here. footage of military outposts controlled by the Bosnian Serbs. The location and movement of Bosnian helicopters and other military hardware can be closely watched using infrared sensors aboard the F-18 Hornet. Unlike conventional radar, infrared sensors use variations in surface temperature to give the pilot a detailed picture of his target. Using the infrared tracking system, a moving target, like this Serbian helicopter, can be easily followed without the subject ever knowing that they are being watched. The line between us and the big white building is just left of it. In fact, I just lost them. Okay, now I got them over there. Because these intelligence gathering missions don't require any available light, they are generally carried out under the relative safety of darkness. Weather conditions can dictate the success of these missions. Unable to penetrate heavy clouds, infrared sensors require a relatively clear sky to provide a view of the ground. Moving around, take a look. Right there is where he's talking about. See that? Now get the diamond off of it so we can see it. There you go. Now walk it back slow. There you go. Walk it back across the bridge slow. There you go. Okay, now hold it there. We'll come back and get another one. The movement of helicopters and tanks are not the only points of interest in Bosnia. Pilots flying over hostile territory must always keep a close eye on their greatest threat, surface-to-air missile launchers, or SAM sites. A whistle of some sort. What's those vehicles? They said there was supposed to be a tank in here somewhere. Yeah, I looked for the tank. I didn't see it, but I count one, two, three, Three, looks like missile launchers and something else. Despite the technological edge enjoyed by the U.S. military, one well-guided SAM could lure America into a conflict that it does not want. Aboard the USS Lincoln, hostile scenarios are simulated to give the newly arrived air wing a look at what they may be up against in the next six months. During this workup phase, war games are undertaken to enhance readiness. Occasionally, the Navy dispatches aircraft from inland bases to challenge the carrier's defenses. For the mission today, there's a lineup on the board. Aircraft today, the fighters will be the F-18s, the bogies will be the F-14s. The mission for the fighters is bar cap. Mission for the bogies is... Shooting fleet. drones may and give pilots useful experience in firing live today. missiles, but true air combat so training so occurs so only when pilots fly against each go other go in a mock dogfight. These are the well. fighting Redcocks uh, of Strike so Fighter we'll Squadron to 22. We'll make sure that we outpins, Today's uh, mission involves taking on four F-14 Tomcats dispatched from Miramar Naval Air Station outside of San Diego. Air combat training is an essential component of overall readiness exercises, but it is by no means a true simulation of real-world combat. On this exercise, our pilots know that the adversaries are coming. They are aware of the tactics they will face and have each counter move carefully planned. However, any combat training is a valuable learning experience. The good thing about today is that we get to do full-up air combat maneuvering. We've got plenty of gas today, a short cycle. And we're going to uh, go out there and fight the F-14s full up. Hornets be uh, Tomcat. OK, just a couple items to remember as we uh, get close to the NATOPS test coming up. Things we need to concentrate on are the immediate action. Back in the ready room belonging to the mighty Shrikes, Squadron Commander Matt Pazteleniak gives a daily pep talk to his pilots. His squadron affectionately refers to him as Paz. As a former linebacker at the Naval Academy, Paz knows what it takes to bring a group of people together to work as a team. 
During Desert Storm, Paz was strike leader on several missions to downtown Baghdad. During this week of combat training exercises, his squadron will be simulating live combat. However, when they want to know what goes through the mind of a pilot entering a war zone, they can simply ask Paz. The first time that I uh, flew over the beach in actual combat was probably the most excited and the most terrified at one time that I've ever been. Uh, the emotions were intermixed. I was uh, completely terrified about the prospect of going into combat and possibly not coming back. But at the same time, it was the culmination that everything that I, of, of everything that I had trained for up until that point, and I was very keyed up. Uh, I likened it to my father in a letter of uh, before a big football game or something. The butterflies and the anticipation, uh, except multiply that times a hundred for me. Anyway, I was just. Uh, completely keyed up, and I think everybody on the ship felt pretty much the same way. Desert Storm was the first large-scale engagement for the U.S. military since the Vietnam War. F-18 squadrons poised on both sides of the Arabian Peninsula were suddenly vaulted into the very scenario they had trained over and over for. However, now the enemy would be shooting back. Surface-to-air missiles and anti-aircraft batteries awaited the arrival of the American planes. To make matters worse, Saddam had a noticeable contingent of Soviet-built MiG-29 fighters poised to challenge the American plane. While on an attack mission over Iraq on the first day of the war, two F-18s from the USS Saratoga spotted two Iraqi MiG-21s. Although both Hornets were fully loaded with 8,000 pounds of bombs, the pilots switched their planes into fighter mode and managed to get behind the MiGs. This is the actual footage of that incident. After both of the MiGs were down, the pilots switched the planes back into attack mode and continued on their mission. During the Persian Gulf War, over 200 Hornets from both the U.S. and Canada flew round-the-clock missions over Iraq and Kuwait. With the Iraqi Air Force taken out of the war in the first few days, Hornet squadrons concentrated their efforts on attacking missile launchers, aircraft bunkers, and other military targets. Laser-guided bombs, or LGBs, had become an eerie symbol of coalition air power during the Gulf War. Honing in on the fractured reflection of a laser beam, the LGB gave Hornet pilots the uncanny ability to target an area as minute as an air conditioner vent. Despite the dominance of coalition air power, the presence of surface-to-air missiles meant that every mission was an adventure. Matt Pasteleniak remembers a close call he had during an attack. Just before I re-entered the clouds, uh, there was a huge flash which was reflected off the top, off the uh, uh, cloud layer. I just assumed that that was my bombs, the explosions of my bombs going off. And just uh, shortly after that, the XO now, who was in the squadron with me also at the time, uh, just came up one word and said, Paz. And I said, yeah, and there was no other answer. Until he reached the ship, Paz had no idea why his squadron mate had called out his name. We were in the ready room afterwards filling out the paperwork, and he came up behind me and said, hey, did you see that? And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, I thought you may have been hit because there was a sand that exploded in front of me right where you were supposed to have been. That's why I called Paz. I thought, it, I thought you'd been hit. So 
things you find out afterwards that had you known at the time may have uh, caused you to uh, blood blood pressure to elevate significantly at the time it was like well uh, i didn't see it no and it was the classic it's the one that you don't see that's probably the one that's going to get you Strike missions were usually carried out by several planes flying together as a group. After the attack, the strike group rejoins and leaves together. However, in the heat of battle, it doesn't always work this way. We were going out on a strike, and we were given intelligence that the Iraqis were trying to tap aircraft as they were egressing from the strike groups. And that they put me on the strike towards the tail end, one of the last airplanes to roll in. And on the roll-in, there was a missile being fired, and I did a jink and uh, realized that the missile was just going up ballistically. It wasn't guiding, came back and uh, dropped my bombs on the target, came off a little low, a lot of AAA and uh, uh, cloud cover around there. Did some jinking, and as I came off target, realized I'd gotten separated from the strike group, which is exactly what you didn't want to have happen. Uh, I had to egress as a single, which is uh, pretty lonely over southern Iraq. Looked up, and I picked up an airplane that was egressing, climbed up on its wing, and it was a lone F-16. Uh, obviously doing the same thing, separated from his strike group. And it, it was as if we both saw each other at the same time. Both airplanes went into perfect uh, formation of beam and we egressed together, uh, hit the water, gave each other a wing flash and kind of went on our own way. But uh, that's the one that I think I remember more than any other. When several planes were downed by anti-aircraft artillery, the strike groups moved the air war to higher altitudes. Now the threat was surface to air missiles instead of artillery fire. However, unlike bullets, most surface-to-air missiles can be outmaneuvered. Commander Raymond Zack experienced this firsthand. And while we were ingressing to the target, we had been intermittently locked up by uh, some SA-2 and 3 sites, some surface-to-air missiles. Box 3, bogey at 11,000. Shut guards. And as it happened, uh, just as we came off target, and we were the last two coming off target, my wingman, who's this was his first mission, was in full afterburner trying to egress from the target and he was about a mile and a half out in front of me and I found myself as the very last guy off target and was locked up by an SA-2 and 3 site. And for whatever reason, I still don't know, I turned around and looked back at my right five o'clock and there at about a thousand yards away was an SA-2 uh, guiding on my airplane. I could see the canards moving on the front of the, uh, the missile itself. With the missiles closing hard, Commander Zack made a series of violent turns and began to release metal chaff and flares to confuse the guidance system on the SAMs. And after three defensive maneuvers, uh, they had pretty much beaten me down to about 150 knots, uh, down at about 11,000 feet, which was perfect envelope for the AAA. So there I was at 150 knots, 11,000 feet, whipping the ponies, trying to get those GE 404s uh, giving me a little bit of acceleration to get back out over the water, uh, feet wet back home. But that one really sticks out in my mind is uh, I could have easily been engaged and shot down on that uh, had I not just looked back at about uh, three seconds before a missile impact and the, mi the missiles uh, exploded behind me after some evasive maneuver. Before Operation Desert Storm, F-18 pilots came here to prepare for war. This is Naval Air Station Fallon, Nevada. Here in Fallon is located the Naval Strike Warfare Center, known to naval aviators as Strike University. Strike University was officially commissioned in September 1984 after an ill-fated attack over Lebanon revealed deficiencies in naval strike procedure. Since 1984, air wings from both coasts have come to Strike University to practice full-scale attack scenarios. The rugged landscape of central Nevada provides a simulation of a hostile country. Within Fallon's vast ranges, the Hornet pilot must find his way to a designated target. En route, he must weave through the ever-changing labyrinth of simulated defenses. Radar stations on the ground keep a watchful eye out for the incoming planes. Targets are heavily defended by soldiers firing mock surface-to-air missiles. If the F-18 pilot has successfully evaded enemy defenses, he will destroy his target. 
Although the enemy is obviously not firing live weapons, this training is the closest a pilot can come to the real thing. The odd paint scheme of this F-18 could be confused with that of an Iraqi MiG-29. This is because the plane belongs to Strike Fighter Squadron 127. At Fallon, this squadron is the enemy. Flying both F-18s and F-5s, the adversary pilot has perhaps the most unique job in the Navy. When we first enter the squadron, we go through an in-house syllabus. And while we're doing that, we try to learn the, the various tactics of all threat countries. You know, the North Koreans, the former Soviet Union, um, anybody out there who you could expect to fight in combat. Um, the, right now, we're concentrating a lot on Iraq and, and Iran. And um, we just try to get up to speed with what they do. We go out there and uh, present that particular tactic to the fleet. And uh, hopefully, then we get blown up and we die. That's our job. Check. Bangers clean on you. One-on-one -on -one dogfights are part of the training at Fallon. High over the mountains of central Nevada, a fleet pilot begins his search for the adversary. 20 miles to the south, the adversary pilot awaits the engagement. As part of his pre-fight ritual, the veteran adversary playfully inverts his hornet to prepare for the unnatural G-forces he will encounter during the fight. By now, the fleet pilot has located the adversary. He has been briefed that the enemy will be an Iraqi pilot flying a MiG-29. The adversary pilot spots the incoming plane and assumes the tactics of an Iraqi pilot. The fleet pilot predicts the Iraqi tactics and takes a 30-degree turn to the east in order to gain a tactical advantage. With both F-18s closing at almost a thousand miles an hour, the entire engagement is monitored closely by officials back in the control tower at Strike University. By now, both planes are within visual range of one another. The adversary pilot has made the evasive maneuvers characteristic of Iraqi pilots. The fleet pilot has countered appropriately. In the chaotic seconds to follow, the fleet pilot manages to get behind the adversary. Unable to shake his pursuer, the adversary pilot can only wait for the growl of his opponent's sidewinder. Although the adversary is an extremely skilled fighter pilot, it is superior tactics that win the day. If we want to, we can win. Um, but that's not really part of our job. Our part is to teach. We're instructors. We're not out there to beat up on anybody. Part of being a professional adversary is to take your ego out of the presentation entirely. And that's why I mentioned earlier, our job is to go out there and basically die. If the fleet guy has done his job properly, then we're going to be taken out of the loop pretty quick. Um, when we first check aboard this squadron, you're taught <clears throat> to become the best fighter pilot you can be, and the most important part of that is becoming a very aggressive pilot. Um, once you get out there, though, you have to be sure to take your ego out, and you got to remember that at all times, the adversary pilot is the guardian of the training rules, and we're the safety uh, observers in any mission. At the end of the three-week training course, the entire air wing comes together for a full-scale war. This simulated war is the culmination of all the training the pilots have received at Fallon. F-18 squadrons must now commence strike missions against enemy targets. These targets are heavily defended by both ground forces and enemy planes. For an F-18 pilot, these are the most realistic and intense missions short of actual combat. The intensity level gets uh, quite high here. Uh, when an air wing comes to the Naval Strike Warfare Center here at Fallon uh, for three weeks, uh, they, don't, they don't have any administrative burdens. They are simply dedicating themselves to lock, stock, and barrel uh, to every waking moment, to putting together these battle plans, uh, uh, drawing up some fairly sophisticated tactics, and then integrating those tactics with the entire uh, air wing, all the squadrons in the air wing, Sometimes it'll be 40 or 50, 60 airplanes launching on a strike. So crafting these plans, 
briefing them, making sure everybody knows exactly where to go and what to do when they get in the airplane to go on the range, and then actually getting in the jet and executing the tactics that they spend so much time planning, the intensity level can get very high. The air war over Nevada begins with the departure of the adversary squadron. Today, the Hornets will simulate North Korean MiG-29. Within minutes, they will assume a defensive position over the target area. With the departure of the enemy forces, the air wing follows close behind. Today, the target is a tank division in a valley south of the airfield. The F-18 pilots depart to the north, where they will regroup and begin their strike. Back at strike, the entire battle is monitored closely on a digital display system. These monitors are part of the Tactical Air Crew Training System, or TACS. TACS allows the evaluators to monitor the flight of every airplane as it is happening out on the ranges. Information from each plane is transmitted in real time via data link back to these display screens. As perhaps the largest and most complex interactive video game in the world, the TAC system is the cornerstone of naval air wing training. Out on the range, the air wing is closing in on the adversary forces. Back at strike, the impending air battle is watched carefully. Fleet airplanes are displayed in green and the adversary planes are red. When an evaluator wants to get a three-dimensional look at the battle, he can simply change the azimuth. As the fleet fighters close on the adversaries, the massive aerial combat exercise begins to unfold. The display screen reveals a continuous play-by-play -play of every move taken by each pilot. For the past three weeks, the fleet pilots have trained in smaller scale combat. However, now they will take on the entire adversary squadron as a group. Skimming over the mountains of Fallon's southern range, a fleet pilot engages the first adversary. To get a more detailed picture of each dogfight, the display screen is switched to the cockpit view of the combatant. Now the evaluators back at strike can see what the pilot is seeing as it is happening. When the fleet pilot attains a lock-on, the tone from his sidewinder will inform the adversary that he has been shot down. On the digital screen, however, the missile is seen hitting the target. One by one, the adversary pilots are knocked out of the training exercise. After being shot down, they must return to the airfield. With the enemy air defense erased from the tactical picture, the strike group continues on their mission. Now the attack will commence. In a desolate valley 15 miles south of the airfield, the enemy tank division is swarmed by the air wing. The raid is carefully executed and the tank division is destroyed. Tomorrow there will be a new target and the entire exercise will begin once again. Welcome Admiral, CAG. Air Wing 15, welcome back to the ITP-8 Alpha debrief. I'm Lieutenant Bob Proano, the overall evaluator for this afternoon's event. After the completion of the day's strike, all of the pilots will regroup for a debriefing back in the tactical display room at Strike University. The entire event has been recorded and can be replayed on the tactical display system at the front of the room. During the debriefing, every aspect of the strike is carefully scrutinized. It is not until after this debriefing that the pilots can truly begin to relax. If there aren't any further questions, if you don't have anything for me, I'd like to invite you to join me for cold beers on the patio. <laughs> Congratulations.
On February 23, 1991, the coalition forces began the ground war against Iraq. Saddam Hussein's most formidable defenses were made up of his elite Republican Guard and their associated tank divisions. The ground assault on Iraq was massive. Over 200,000 troops had moved westward to envelop the Iraqi army. Despite a month of aerial bombardment, coalition leaders were unsure of the amount of resistance they would encounter in the ensuing battle for Kuwait. So as the coalition ground forces spearheaded their way across the border, the aerial bombing campaign was replaced by the need for close air support. Flying out of bases in Saudi Arabia, Marine Corps F-18 squadrons flew round-the-clock ground support missions throughout the invasion. During such missions, forward air controllers on the ground worked closely with the Hornet pilots in determining exactly which target to hit. Any resistance met by troops on the ground was quickly brought to the attention of Marine Corps pilots loitering in the area. Within three days, the ground war would be over. This is the Marine Air Corps Ground Combat Center in 29 Palms, California. Ten times a year, the Marines engage in massive armed exercises not unlike the invasion of Iraq. Although this is simply a dress rehearsal, every attempt is made to simulate live combat. A combined armed exercise can last anywhere between two and six weeks. During this period, the Marines engage in a variety of battlefield scenarios using loaded guns and live artillery. The exercises will culminate with the Finex, a three-day war involving as many as two battalions of Marines. During a real combat situation, Marines are some of the first to arrive on the scene. For this reason, battle exercises attempt to simulate the tactics employed when vastly outnumbered by enemy troops. Only miles from the battlefield, Marine Corps pilots live in tents, much the way they would during a true wartime situation. When the call comes in for air support, the pilots scramble to their F-18s. Within minutes, they are in the air. Hurtling towards the battlefield, the pilot contacts the forward air controller on the ground. The location of the target is identified and attacked. The relationship between the Marine Corps pilot and the man on the ground is unique to their service. All Marine officers undergo the same training. Marine pilots are familiar with the experience of trudging through swamps and deserts with heavy boots and a rifle. When an infantryman calls for close air support, the pilot understands the predicament faced by his fellow Marine. Out of all the various missions they carry out, Every Marine pilot will attest that close air support is the most satisfying. As the steadily fading sun gives way to darkness over the Sierra Nevadas, the moon emerges as the only source of light. In the past, the darkness of night has hindered flight operations for military aircraft. Even with the terrain-hugging technology of modern jet fighters, most pilots feel uncomfortable careening through mountains they cannot see. This is roughly what you would see if you were sitting in the back seat of an F-18 wearing a pair of night vision goggles. The night vision goggle, or NVG, takes available light and amplifies it several thousand times. It only intensifies light, so you have shadows out on the ground at night just like you have during the day. If you've got a full moon out there, you 
you're flying in the mountains on the back side of the uh, where the source of light is, uh, you've got a shadow and that's just a dark hole. Uh, you can't see anything in there and uh, it can scare you if you turn into one of those without uh, being aware of that before you make your turn. The night vision goggles amplify light that already exists. In absolute darkness, the NVG is not effective. However, it only takes starlight to illuminate the ground. A full moon is almost blinding. With a full moon out there uh, up at a high altitude, uh, it amplifies all the light uh, going uh, down low level. It's just, just like flying during the day. It's, uh, you can see everything down there. It's just absolutely beautiful. Night attack exercises are often done with the help of NVGs. Our pilot is now attacking a target with a barrage of rockets. Because of the sensitivity of the night vision goggles, standard cockpit displays would be almost blinding to the pilot. For this reason, the F-18s have a switch that allows the pilot to set the cockpit lighting to a night vision setting. When the pilot approaches the well-lit landing area, he will remove his NVGs and switch the cockpit lighting back to the standard mode. The effectiveness of the night vision goggle is also its drawback. For example, the lights from distant air traffic are a constant distraction. The strobes on civilian airliners are extremely bright. It's a white light and a red light, which uh, the MVGs amplify the best. And you can see airplanes uh, well over 100 miles away. From uh, central Nevada, uh, where Fallon is located, you can see aircraft flying into LAX, Los Angeles International. Another piece of technology available to the F-18 pilot is the simulator. Here at Naval Air Station Lemoore in Central California are housed the three F-18 simulators used by Pacific Fleet pilots. Right now I'm stepping into one of the two trainers that we have here. We've actually got two of the weapons trainers in here that our Hornet pilots can practice any of the missions that the Hornet has. Night carrier, uh, all-weather attack, air-to-air, air-to-ground and uh, just about anything that the Hornet can do, we can do in here and a little bit uh, more economical than flying it in the aircraft. So what I'd like to do now is go ahead and go inside and we'll fly a quick mission and let you see what happens. Inside the dome here, you can see the trainer that I'm gonna be climbing inside of, and also you can hear the echo that comes from this almost perfect spherical dome in here. Inside the, the dome, they will project the image that uh, I will use for my visual cues and everything like that. Uh, be able to see the targeting uh, information, the uh, fighters and stuff that I'll be going against the ground and everything else. So we'll go ahead and climb inside and, and get her started. While Carl prepares for his simulated flight, all of the information concerning the mission is being loaded into the simulator's computer console in the next room. It is decided that Carl will take off out of Lemoore on a sunny afternoon. If he had so chosen, Carl could have been catapulted from an aircraft carrier on a rainy evening. Shortly after takeoff, it is decided that Carl's flight will be interrupted by two enemy fighters. We got two bogeys coming at you, two F-5s. A tactical display screen shows the location of the aircraft and all movements during the dogfight. On the display screen, Carl's two Sidewinder missiles can be seen heading towards the enemy planes. Occasionally, aerial combat training involves one pilot in each of the two simulators. In this sort of training, the simulators become interactive, and the pilots can fly against each other. Having defeated the simulated bogeys, Carl now switches his F-18 back into attack mode. The target today will be the Miramar Naval Air Station outside of San Diego. The purpose of the F-18 is to be able to fight its way into a target, bomb the target, then fight its way out. 
Therefore, it is not uncommon for a Hornet pilot to conduct both aerial combat and attack training in the same mission. After attacking the air station at Miramar, Carl egresses to the southwest. Now flying at low levels to avoid being picked up on radar, Carl follows Interstate 15 down towards Jack Murphy Stadium and onto Interstate 163. While executing some hard turns to avoid ground fire, Carl continues down Route 163 on a course that will take him directly over downtown San Diego. While such a flight would never really be authorized, in a simulator, it can be done any time. Okay, we're going to switch the visual scene to, from day to dusk now. With the press of a button, daylight is replaced by dusk. Santa Catalina Island can be seen in the distance as Carl descends toward the ship. In any flight, whether simulated or real, the carrier landing is the most difficult part of the mission. The men and women of the USS Abraham Lincoln are all too aware of the dangers of carrier flight operations. Just three days ago, an F-18 pilot from VFA-22 was killed when his aircraft mysteriously plunged into the water during a night catapult launch. The death of a shipmate and friend has provided everyone a somber reminder that aboard a carrier, disaster comes easily, yet success is always a challenge. It's dangerous. I mean, we've already lost two people, two of good, good friends of ours, uh, in the last two workup cycles. It's not a safe place to be. But it's not something we dwell on, either. It's uh, exciting, challenging, and it's uh, some place where every single one of us wants to be. And we compete to be here. And it's, it's near and dear to our hearts to do this kind of job. If you dwell on it, you're, you're doomed. So we just kind of just go on. It's dangerous, but it's not dangerous if you know what you're doing and you're very professional and you use your checklist and your procedures and all that type of stuff. The, the movie Top Gun, is, it was a myth. Nobody flies like that. There are no JOs. We, we may pan around and I make, I make fun of NFOs and stuff like that, but that's all in good spirit because we all know that uh, five minutes from now, one of us may not make it back aboard the ship. And that humor and that banter is very important to the morale. And we know it's dangerous, but if you know what you're doing, it takes a lot of the danger out of it. Right, training is training. very crucial. I mean, it gives you the confidence to do the things that we do that are crazy, if you think about it. I mean, who wants to hurdle a 45,000 pound jet into an aircraft carrier? It's, it's insane, but you train and you fall back on the training and, it, and it's, it's not, you don't, you know, panic. It's just, okay, I've been trained for this, I do it. And it's, uh, it's natural. After today's mission, both Hornet squadrons will return to their home base in Lemoore, California. In just a month, they will return to these very same hallways for their six-month cruise. In the meantime, they will continue to train and prepare for the unseen events that the future has in store.